point. All right, so we are nearly all here, full of coffee, orange juices, and uh, nice views. Thank you. So it will continue. We have four speakers before lunch. And um, so Joanna Bridge, yes, will uh, speak about the super eight galaxies, very bright, very bright galaxies at C equal eight. Oh, that's an achievement so far. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, there's a little bit of false advertising on the, on the program. Um, I was going to talk about IFU spectroscopy of uh, large galaxies. Um, the original work was done by Christian Herrens uh, in 2016 where uh, he looked at the velocity and velocity dispersion maps from H-alpha and, uh, you know, was looking at basically how the kinematics relate to the Lyman-alpha escape. And so I'm, you can stay tuned for work on that. We're working on um, an extended uh, sample of that kind of work. But I decided to talk about something different today. Um, who cares about Z of zero when you talk about Z of eight? Um, so this is work that I have been doing at the University of Louisville in Kentucky. Uh, in concert with Bene Holverda and um, some other people. So hopefully today we'll talk a little bit about um, why we care about really bright galaxies at Redshift 8, um, how do we find them, and what can they tell us about reionization and kind of the bigger picture of uh, the evolution at that Redshift range. Okay, so as we all know, well, I maybe I shouldn't assume that, many of us know that the luminosity function is generally thought to be well described by a Schechter function that evolves smoothly with redshift um, in both slope and normalization. Um, the bright end of the luminosity function uh, in particular has given people some trouble re recently at higher redshift um, in that we seem to find uh, too many really bright galaxies, so above um, you know, uh, absolute magnitude about minus 22, uh, then, then is predicted by a Schechter function. And so uh, we kind of want to look in, like, uh, kind of get to the bottom of uh, maybe understanding wh why this is the case and if it is actually the case, because right now the, the, n the number of studies are still, the number of galaxies that we found at that uh, magnitude range are still quite, uh, there's not a lot of them. So, um, for example, uh, here's a study that was done by uh, Ballard et al. in 2014, um, and several studies have kind of backed this up, showing that uh, perhaps instead of a Schechter function uh, at the bright end at high redshift, perhaps a, a, maybe a double power law would be a better fit uh, to the luminosity function. Um, however, as I kind of already mentioned, uh, we don't have a lot of galaxies here, and so we are uh, limited by basically the, the small number statistics in our sample. So this is one thing that we kind of wanted to explore with this particular uh, work that we're doing now. Um, this of course has been covered already, but you know, why do we care specifically about the bright end of the luminosity function? Well, it's, it's because we think at this redshift range, um, you know, they, the, the really bright galaxies could be driving uh, some of this reionization by creating um, bubbles. Simulations have been done that indicate that bubble size grows with galaxy luminosity, which is um, kind of makes sense. 
And so, and so this is a, if these bright galaxies are a driver of reionization, then that's something that we want to be able to understand more fully. So, of course, uh, this was referenced earlier, but you know, the way that we really find these galaxies is basically playing a game of now you see it, now you don't. Um, so, uh, you, you, the Lyman break, wherever the Lyman break occurs, of course, gives you a really good idea of what the redshift is of your galaxies. So, without having to spectroscopically confirm these galaxies, we can do, uh, we can, we can kind of do some, uh, basically detective work based solely on the photometry. And so for this project, we were looking for wide dropout galaxies that occur um, somewhere uh, just uh, blueward of, the, of one, one micron. So another way um, that you can identify really uh, these kind of really bright high redshift galaxies, particularly if you're limited by your photometry or you don't have um, a lot of photometric data on your galaxies, is by looking at sources with really high, uh, with really red IRAC colors. So um, this has been shown particularly with a sample um, that was presented by Robert Persani in 2016. Um, he presented a set of four um, four galaxies that had these really uh, red IRAC colors, which is an indication um, that there may be uh, quite vigorous star formation going on. They're very energetic because if your lines such as O3 and H beta fall into the IRAC range, then you would expect the, kind of a large differential uh, in the flux between the two bands. And so uh, this has been uh, successfully shown. And in fact, uh, interestingly enough, all four of these galaxies have been uh, spectroscopically confirmed. Um, they, they are uh, together some of the highest, I think maybe the highest redshift galaxies that have been spectroscopically confirmed to be other Lyman alpha. So this makes uh, this particular type of galaxy, these really bright galaxies with red IRAC colors, very interesting because finding Lyman alpha is difficult at this redshift, um, both both technologically and physically, you know, through the neutral um, neutral medium. So, with this in mind, we wanted to basically come up with uh, a sample of particularly bright, so h band magnitude uh, brighter than 25.5 uh, galaxies, where the Lyman break falls somewhere in the Y band, as I mentioned previously. We did this using the Brightest of Reionizing Galaxies survey, or the Borg survey, um, which has been a really, this is a really useful survey for this particular kind of work. The reason being that Borg is a pure parallel. Um, for those of you who don't know about the, about the Borg survey, basically, um, you know, while HST is off looking at other very important uh, objects, we can basically be like, hey, also while you're there, can you just point uh, can you just point the spectrograph at the sky and tell us what you see? Uh, so, you know, the drawback, of course, is that a lot of these data are, are shallow, sometimes only half an orbit, but you get a very wide search area, um, which helps you be convinced that perhaps you are not running into issues of um, maybe your galaxies all being in the same ionized bubble, for example. Um, so that was one of the concerns uh, that we had with the Roberts Persani galaxies, is that three, three out of four of them were found in the candles EGS field, um, one of them in a, in a different candles field. And it just, I don't know about you guys, but it makes me a little bit nervous when um, you can't uh, be certain that, that, the, uh, that there's not something going on there uh, because of the kind of directed nature of of the field you're looking in. So with the Borg data, we went out and collected a sample of eight galaxies that have satisfied these criteria. And um, we called them the super eights because there are eight of them and they're at redshift eight. So why not? Um, so four of them had been previously identified by Calvi et al. in 2016. Um, and the other four came from further Borg searches that we conducted. Um, looking for these, uh, you know, the, these Lyman break um, features. So with this sample, we went out and we got more, uh, more photometry because one thing that the Borg survey didn't have was the I-band photometry, so the F814W filter. 
um, which is really important for characterizing the slope of that uh, Lyman break, if you will. In other words, if it's not a break, um, you'll uh, detect the galaxy in the I band, and you may end up finding that your what you thought was a high redshift galaxy is actually a low redshift interloper. So the I band is really important for that. In addition, we got Spitzer data, um, which has turned out to be like awesome and also not awesome at the same time, and I'll talk about why. Um, so we went forth and and uh, conquered basically. <laughs> Uh, so we performed photo photometric redshift fitting to determine, um, you know, if, if our galaxies are basically where we th thought they were. Um, and indeed, we found that, um, I'm only going to show a couple of them here, uh, but we found that um, uh, uh, most of these galaxies are in fact at redshift 8. Um, our IRAC data, it's really awesome to have it, but they were very shallow um, observations. And so it's, it's, it's a little frustrating because we, we can't say anything definitive about the red IRAC colors of these, of these objects. Um, but it still is, um, it, they do help constrain the photo Z fitting, which we did with both um, EZ and BPZ, if you're familiar with algorithms that do this, uh, to just kind of verify those results. So here's one galaxy. This one is actually the highest uh, redshift in the sample at about 9.5. Um, we also, here's another one. Uh, this is one of the objects that was uh, identified by Calvi and actually followed up um, recently uh, by Livermore 2018 with some uh, F098M data. So you can kind of see the general idea. And this, this one is cool because we actually do have some um, uh, not just upper limit IRAC data that that may indicate um, that there's some, some strong activity going on in the galaxy. So this is uh, just to point out how useful the I-band data are and, uh, and the Spitzer data, uh, you can see how um, in some cases it really constrained the photometric redshift fitting uh, to have those extra data points. Um, in some cases it didn't make that much of a difference. Um, so of course I showed the one where it made the most difference because it looks really it looks better on the slide. Okay, um, and one of our galaxies was unfortunately um, found to be a low redshift interloper. It's a little weird because our IREC detections are actually way off of what the models predict, um, and I, that's a little frustrating because it's, a, it's a kind of actually a poor fit, but it's definitely, you can see from the, the flux in the I band um, that it's definitely not a, a high redshift galaxy. So our aptly named eight super eight galaxies at Z of eight, there's now only seven of them. Okay, so just to reiterate kind of how bright these galaxies are, you can see they're shown there in green on this uh, magnitude redshift plot, and they are among some of the brightest galaxies that have been found at this redshift. Um, some of them are the brightest. Um, just as a side note, that little point down there at, at Z of 9.1, that really dim one, I'm sure you guys have, uh, have, have seen the paper from Hashimoto earlier this year. That's an ALMA detection um, of O3 at 88 microns, which I think, uh, given this, particularly the delays in JWST, which are, is just gonna you know, blow open high redshift galaxy studies, um, we kind of are, are forced to work with the, the radio data, but I, I'm not a radio data person, but I think it's, it's, they're doing some really cool stuff with that looking at high redshift galaxies, and of course probing a completely different end of the luminosity function. So finally, we uh, went ahead and uh, put our, our galaxies, I split them up into two, uh, two different redshift ranges because we kind of covered a, ended up covering quite a range of redshifts with the survey. And I don't know that we particularly help uh, decide what is the best way to fit the luminosity function at the bright end uh, any more than we already knew, but we add, we add our voices to the crowd. Um, our, our, our point does lie slightly above the Schechter function at Z of 8. Um, whether or not you can draw any conclusive, uh, uh, conclusion, conclusive conclusions from that, um, I don't know. Okay, so next step, we're going to go look for Lyman alpha emission. We've actually already done some Keck observations on four of these galaxies. Um, this is not one of them. That's uh, one of the Roberts-Bersani 
galaxies. Um, and so stay tuned for that uh, because it would be, everybody else has had such luck looking at, for Lyman Alpha, maybe we'll get lucky too. Uh, but I don't have any results on that yet. And then finally, we're also getting deeper IRAC data, um, which will make me feel a lot better about life. So hopefully we've answered some of the questions about why we care about bright galaxies at high redshift and, um, uh, and, and what they can kind of help tell us about how re reionization occurred at that redshift. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> you say that uh, you have no hints about uh, you have no hint about the uh, Lyman alpha emission in those galaxies yet. I mean, I I ran the data through the pipeline and I looked at it. Okay. Any question? <laughs> no question. Okay. Then thank you. Thank you very much. I call the next uh, speaker. Matthew, where is Matthew? Ah, okay. Thanks. Uh, Matthew is going to talk about stellar feedback in starburst galaxies. No, 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 no. No, it's not that. So it's another one. I so I take this. a randomly, if you want. Uh, I might have to announce the title myself. <laughs> Hold on. How do I do this? So you have um, how much? 15 minutes as well. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, I, um, is that right? No, that's not right. So, how do I make this go? Like that? Yeah. All right. So, yeah, I have also um, changed the order of my talk. I had was given also a talk on Friday and today. And I'm going to take the science aspects out of my talk today and put them on Friday. And I'm going to use this 10 minutes to do a little bit of advertising for a new project, which we call the Lyman Alpha Spectral Database. So it's run at, uh, by Axel Runholm and Max Grunke, who are really doing all of, the, uh, all of the work on this project. I'm standing here talking because I have a, a more convenient time slot and another talk. But, um, so yeah, so the point of this is that, you know, as we've heard about and as we're going to hear more about, I'm, I'm very sure, there's an awful lot of Lyman Alpha spectra that have been obtained by you know, various instruments, hundreds of different instruments probably, at very many different redshifts of all different kinds of galaxies. And people have used these data to measure whatever quantities that they've been interested in for whatever question they were trying to answer in their, in their scientific studies. So this could be, you know, most ordinarily flux and equivalent width and things like asymmetry, peak velocity shifts, broadening, um, line separation, or whatever. And then um, the issue that we identified is that people make all of these measurements in very different ways, and they don't report, you know, all of the quantities that there are out there. Um, and we thought this was. This is the way that we operate, right? But, um, but this is um, something that we could improve upon. So, um, you know, we know that mo most, uh, you know, almost all studies involve a comparison between some data and another data set, or um, all observers, you know, you find some new, some new Lyman alpha spectra in your data and you want to go and compare with somebody else's sample or another data set or a different redshift or a different selection function. People say things like, yeah, hey, my spectrum is really weird, but they, they can't quantify how weird. Or they want to know if there are any other galaxies out there with similar line profiles or similar quantities. Um, they say things like, um, yeah, we want to study the evolution of certain set of spectral features with redshift or with other galaxy properties, star formation rates or masses or whatever else. And then, you know, you, make all, you do all this work and you write a paper and then eventually somebody says, well, why didn't you compare with this sample instead? This sample is much better. And, um, whatever. Um, and really, you know, all of these spectra, with very few exceptions, I think, are all living on your hard drives. And uh, Lyman Alpha spectra would like to be free. So we decided that it would be a good investment of some of our time to create a database to store all these things in and to make all of the measurements in a completely homogeneous way. Um, 
So now my next slide says it's uh, live demo time. And um, yeah, <laughs> we'll see if this works. Huh? So I've got to kill this, such I do like that. I'll give you a little tour of the um, tour of the web page. So it's online at no, not Facebook. LimanAlpha.com. Yes. All right, that's the first step done. But um, okay, so yeah, this is the this is the web page here. It's probably better viewed on a computer than it is on a on a very on a low resolution projector. We have a nice image here. Wait a minute. Where's the um? Where's the little bar with the? Shouldn't there be a bar across? Oh, is it in the? Has it moved to here now? Yes, it's moved to there. Okay, on the screen. You know, if you're looking on a high resolution screen, it looks different from the this thing that's. All right. So we have um, uh, a nice spectrum here and um, a database. So we'll have a look at. Um, so there's an explore place here, and the database currently has only five entries in it. These are all the Redshift galaxies, some of the Lyman Brake analogs, some green peas, a couple of Lars galaxies. Here, here is an example is your favorite galaxy, Lars 14. If I click on that, you see here there's a SDSS footprint, and there's the, the spectrum. There's another version of the spectrum here. These are all hopefully zoomable, so you can do something like that and look at the Lyman Alpha profile or some other absorption lines that may fall in the, in the, in the similar region. There's another Lyman Alpha line and there's some, some you know, this is showing the Lyman Alpha equivalent width of everything that's in the database at the moment. And then we have made a large number of measurements. So we make, I think, 31 measurements in total. Um, so the first thing that we do is identify a, um, identify a redshift based upon some fitting algorithm, and then we shift the spectrum into the rest frame and measure, for example, velocity shifts of Lyman alpha and equivalent width and full width half maxima, continuum flux density and integrated fluxes, positions of a valley if there's a double peak, um, red and blue peak spectral components, um, and, uh, and skewness. Um, um, and how do I do that? Oh, yeah, I've got to go here. So I will try now. Okay. I think I'm just going to reload this. <laughs> I don't know how to go back to the front page. Oh, we go there. Click that, yeah. All oh, right, there it goes. And we go to upload data. I mean, this all worked last night like a charm, right? You, you know, obviously that's true. So then I pre-prepared a few spectra somewhere. So this is um, I'm going to go through the process of adding another one to the database. So we're going to pick this. Um, this is quite. I'm going to first show you what the spectrum looks like. So I use your your favourite data analysis tool, IRAFS plot. Show you what the spectrum looks like. Zoom in here. It's not that one. Lyman Alpha spectrum looks like that. Um, you know, the wrong way around. We upload um, upload spectra in ASCII format, so I can go here, choose a file, find the find the new one, which is this guy here. This was observed by HST Cars with a resolution of 20,000 at a redshift of something, at an approximate redshift of this value with a very small error, and it lives on the sky, these coordinates, copy those, we'll make and choose to make these spectra publicly available for download or not, in which case you'll only be able to retrieve the parameters that we fit. Um, I say this one shall remain private because it's, well, because we're not done yet. Um, the database is not complete. I'll say, give it a, a citation for this, which is close to Rivera-Torsen 2015. 
And then we also have a bunch of optional fields as well, right? So I can give this a name, and this galaxy is called Elars 07. And it also has a measured systemic redshift, so we don't only work with our, our own derived redshifts, but also you have to give you the option, if you have a known systemic redshift for your galaxy, to enter that as well, and in which case we make all the measurements two times. This is the known systemic redshift, which also has a very small error. This has a star formation rate of four solar masses per year, or similar. And then we go, this is where it's going to break. Then we upload the spectrum, and if my Wi-Fi is good enough, so we look that, okay, form submission was successful, excellent. So, ah, this problem again. All right, so now I know that what you do is you go back to the front page, and then you click there and you go to uh, explore. There's now six entries in the database, of which the last one is this one. And I click there, and there it is. It's now been added to this plot down here, and here are all the various measurements for it. This tab here is the um, automatically identified redshift. This is here, this is assuming the systemic redshift that we entered. Um, any of these quantities, so you want to know what they are, well the EW is perhaps quite obvious, but you can click there and you get a little description of what it is and what units it's in. If you want to, now this, is a, this does work, doesn't work, okay, it works, that's a one time only button apparently. So um, we click there and you can upload download, you can go to download, you can download all the spectra, download all the measurements, in which case you get a little zip file with all the data in them. Um, and uh, that's where we are right now. So what I would like to do, oh, there's the download coming. So what I would like to do, well, we can answer this question now in that it does work. And now that it does work, we would like you to go and play with it a little bit, right? So this is currently password protection, but we're just about to take the password off. Is that right, Axel? Yeah. And um, so you can go and have a look and um, play with it. Now the important thing is we want to have feedback from the community. Oh, thanks, Daniel. We want to have you know, your ideas about what you would like to have included in this database because we've come up with a list of 31 measurements that we can make and we are making, but maybe you have some more suggestions or there's something in particular that you'd like or some extra form data. Um, please come and speak to us at this meeting. We've still got a couple of days left, so that's why I'm talking now to give us you know, time to have some conversations about this. Um, and uh, yeah, that's all I have to say, I think. Yeah, that's all. Very good. Yeah. Okay, so I inviting to uh, yeah to go on Bull's uh, the, the site. Yes. Yeah, have a play, have a play very and nice. try and break it. It's uh, very important. Any question? Any comment? No. Oh yeah, please. So this is very nice, and I think you're looking for input from the community for all their spectra. If I have 300 Lyman Alpha spectra that I'd like to add to the database, clearly I'm not going to fill out that form for each one I that you have. Okay. Yeah. Bulk upload plans? Right, so what we want to do, what we haven't done yet, is to allow a tarball upload. So you can put what we're going to do. We've certainly thought about this, and that we saw the, um, all this form now, come on. We saw all this form, not there. Blah. Oh, it's because it's not on the right. Maybe that's why. Oh, it doesn't work. It's not even, it's not the website. It's my computer that doesn't work, I think. Um, so, yeah. Um, we were, you know there was all that form data. We can also enter that. <clears throat> I'm not sure if it's working right now, but in a header of an ASCII file. So if you were to able to, to um, uh, get the, um, the, the vital quantities written in the header of an ASCII file and tar that, that would be, that should work. Um, but yeah, that's something we, we really thought about or we, we, we recognize as an issue. So we're going to begin by populating, oh yeah, I should have said that, I think. We're going to begin by populating this with basically the COS archive at low redshift. So all of the ones that we've observed and you know, any others in the room have also looked at. So with LB and the order of 150, redshift less than 0.4 Lyman alpha spectra. And then all of the ones that the Muse team has made available publicly in um, 
whatever it's called, that database in France. Um, Will it be possible CDS. to give a feedback? I mean, if you have a question, why do booze? Yes. And can you, can you uh, fill in a special window or something and say, ask a question? You know, like a little contact form or something like that? Yeah, we'll do live, live feedback on the... There was something else I wanted to say, now I realise. What was that? Last project. No, I've forgotten what it was. Okay, right. anyway, we will. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Matt. So, next, uh, next talk, a handbook, stellar feedback in Blue Compact Galaxy, ISO 338 minus IJ04. I hope it's the title. Yeah? That it's is the, the title, indeed. Okay. Thank you. All right, yes, thank you. Yes, I'm going to talk about um, results we have obtained with the MU spectrograph, um, trying to understand the stellar feedback in this blue compact dwarf galaxy ESO338. It's actually, at, today it appeared on AstroPH, so after my talk you can go and check it. This is work done together with the Stockholm group. Um, actually, all the co-authors are, are also in the audience here. So, just to recap all the things we've heard about feedback in the last few days, uh, so, I always like to show this image, which is the image of the 30 Doradus region in the LMC, which is kind of the most massive cluster we can actually resolve stars in. And it shows exactly what we, how, how, how messy feedback is. Right? So, the, the blue color, the blue diffuse emission here is X-ray emission taken from Townsley et al. And then here the orange stuff is, is Spitzer data. And what you see is that the cluster, which is, hard, which is here inside the center, has basically blown, totally messed up its molecular cloud created um, 10 to the 7 Kelvin gas, and also there is still a lot of dust around. So it creates all the different ISM phases and makes a, m makes a big mess of everything. If you put it, this at 100 megaparsec, you just see this all in one pixel. Right? Just so we know that feedback works on different types of feedback, works on different time scales. We have the Lyman continuum radiation, stellar winds, working at the, at, at the younger stages, yeah? less than 3, 4 million years. And then eventually the, su the, su the supernova feedback will take over, pumping a lot of mechanical energy into the ISM. And as you can already see in this picture on the background, eh, what does feedback do? It creates super bubbles, it drives galactic scale outflows, it, gives all the, uh, it changes all the ISM phases, it creates a very hot gas, X-ray emitting gas, 10 to the 7 Kelvin, warm gas, uh, in you see in H-alpha, but also it, it affects the, the molecular gas and the warm neutral gas. It can enrich uh, the IGM and also the ISM with metals from Wolverine stars, from supernovae. And, of course, important for this meeting, it is the main responsible for Lyman continuum and Lyman alpha escape, certainly if you look at Star Wars Galaxy. So, what we're trying to do is look at blue compact galaxies which are relatively nearby, so within 100 megaparsec. Here you see Haro 11, which Joran already talked about, and this is E338, which I'm going to talk about. And these things are strong, strongly star forming. They have an elevated star formation rate. They are local analogs of high redshift galaxies, where we cannot resolve all this detail. These galaxies are such that we can still resolve all the, cluster the whole cluster population with HST imaging. And they contain dozens of superstar clusters, so we can actually study the feedback mechanisms correctly uh, in, in detail, and some of them are Lyman continuum leakers, or at least suspected Lyman continuum leakers. So um, this is a program with VLT Muse. Some results have already been shown by Joram. Veronica Menace will show this afternoon some more results, and you've already seen Christian Hiren's poster on another galaxy. And so we have um, basically optical spectra from uh, the blue side, we have helium-2 all the way to sulfur-3, and 9,000 angstrom and all the typical ISM lines you can use for determining the physical properties of, of the ISM. So, ESO 338, you probably recognize this image because you've been staring at it the whole week. This is on your batch. Um, this is the ESO 338 image from HST data. So the blue is UV, the optical is in green, and the H-alpha is in red. So you see all these white dots here. These are all these superstar clusters. And you see how it affects the ISM here. It, has, it, it blows bubbles here. You see this H-alpha is very filamentary, being blown away by the, by the, by the star clusters. And so this has a large population of young star clusters. So this is the cluster formation rate, cluster formation history. 
And you see that most star clusters are actually less than 10 million years old. So there are a lot of Lyman continuum emission, a lot of mechanical feedback as well. And then this um, galaxy is also um, an indirect detection of Lyman continuum leakage has been made based on the C2 line, as, which is a saturated line but not going all the way to zero. This galaxy is too low redshift to directly detect the Lyman continuum with costs, unfortunately. So, zooming in a little bit on cluster 23, which is the most massive cluster in this galaxy, it has a dynamical mass of 10 to the 7 solar masses, it's the one here. And you see, this is an H-alpha narrowband image, and you see that it has blown a huge bubble here. So inside this bubble, there's, ba there, there's barely any gas left, at least warm gas left. It might be filled with X-ray gas, X-ray emitting gas. And uh, the mu spectra of this cluster also show that it has both red stars. And it is about 6 million years old. So now I'm going to show you the MUSE data. So this is a three-color um, image re from, taken from the MUSE cube. And if we have an IFU, we have a spectrum of each of those pixels. We can now make an image in an emission line. So I'm now going to show you the image in H-alpha. And you see it looks dramatically different. So the contours here are, again, that continuum image. And you see that this galaxy is surrounded by an enormous halo of ionized gas. Basically, effectively, the entire field of view we had for one arc minute squared was filled with H-alpha emission. It's very filamentary. There are lots of structures happening in this, um, in, in this halo, so it's a very complicated area. So now we can look at the kinematics, which do not make it easier. As you see here, to the left, this is the, 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 the velocity map. The velocities are relatively low, only plus or minus 30 kilometers per second. And this is the velocity dispersion map, which varies between 20 and 180, 200 kilometers per second. And if we zoom in a little bit into the velocity map here in the center, you see here this redshifted emission here to the north, this complex, and one to the south, which look like galactic scale outflows. Um, the velocity dispersion map shows a very turbulent velocity pattern. We try to look for a rotation curve, but it's impossible. There is no way we can derive a rotation curve from this because the halo, the velocity is too messed up. So we cannot derive a dynamical mass of this galaxy. And the kinematics are highly dispersion dominated, which has been seen also for several large galaxies in Christian Heeres paper and also for high redshift star forming galaxies. This is typical, that these are dispersion dominated galaxies. So one of the things now we can do is try to look, for example, at the Lyman alpha image, the, the, the Lyman alpha emission and see if we can find any way how Lyman alpha can escape. And so this left image here is an image taken um, with data taken from Usli in 2009. So the blue um, emission here is Lyman alpha, um, the red is H alpha and the green is UV continuum. And you see that the, eight, the, the Lyman alpha is extending very far out because of the scattering. But it has some preferred directions where it comes out. So here there is to the north and here to the southwest. There seems to be an increase in the emission. When you overplot that on the velocity map, yeah, so here the contours are basically this image, and you see that these bright emissions here seem to be located, seem to be associated with the outflowing gas. So you might have feared that the outflow is pushing out the neutral gas so that it's out of the resonance frequency and Lyman alpha could escape more easily. So we can do a similar trick for Lyman continuum and then we're going to look at the ionization. So we're using the ionization, map, ionization parameter mapping, which has also been discussed several times yesterday and today. We're using O3 over S2 because O2 does not fall in the Muse wavelength range. And what you see here is that the... So I'm doing O3 over S2, so white means high O3 and dark means a high S2. And so the, the center is heavily ionized, which is not surprising because that's where, my, that's where your star clusters are. These blue contours here are helium-2 emission, so it's also, there is a lot of diffuse helium-2 emission. And you see here that there are two ionization channels, one to the north, one to the south. And here in the east and western part, you see that the, that the gas is more neutral. And so these channels could be... Um, could allow the Lyman, Lyman continuum to escape. When we look at further at distances, we're now changing S2 for H alpha, and the reason is just that we can trace the halo further out, but it has, it's, it has a similar di diagnostics, and you see that the ratio, so again you see these channels here, but you also see that the ratio goes up when you go outside of the halo, meaning that this galaxy is not, um, is not ionization bound, but it's density bound. The optical depth is very low, is low here, so Lyman continuum photons can actually es escape out of the halo, at least as far as we see the ionized gas here. 
So the last thing I'm going to show you is a BPT analysis. As you know, we have from each location in the halo, we have a spectrum. So we can plot this in the BPT diagram. Typically, this is used for um, integrated galaxy spectra to separate star formation, star forming galaxies from AGNs. But we can also do a two-dimensional analysis. And then this will tell us about the physical properties of the gas and the conditions of the ISM. And so this is the upper left portion of the typical BPT diagram. These galaxies is highly ionized, so it's in the upper left area. These are the typical separation lines. And this is basically, these are all the data points. This is the one with N2. These are all the data points, so all the, the spexels of our IFU, colored by the intensity of, of, of H alpha. So you see that the brightest region are also the highest integrated. This is an um, average value of the galaxy. So when you integrate over the entire emission, the galaxy will play here. Overplotted, I have the shock models of um, Allen et al. 2008. And so we can try to compare what does the emission come from. Is it all photoionization or are also shocks playing a role? Well, as you see here, this diagram is a bit difficult because the shock models lay in the star formation zone. But when you change the x-axis to, for example, S2 or even better, O1, you see that a lot of these data points are moving, are crossing the line and coming into the area where you have, um, where you would have your AGM or your liner galaxies. And so this is, can, can be in, in, interpreted as shock emission. And you see also that the shock models here are actually um, you know, covering this, this location very well. So what we can do now is try to we take again this BPT diagram and now try to select specific areas in the BPT plot and see where they fall in the galaxy, okay, if they are coherent or they're just random locations. So I'm going to show, again, these are the three BPT plots. So this is the one with N2, the one with S2, and the one with O1. And they always have O3 over H beta on the, on the y-axis. These are all the data points here in black. And I'm going to add several colors to this. The first one is when you look at this here, you see that there is this sequence here of, of very high O3 H, H beta data points, which is kind of separated from the rest. When you look where they are, it, they are here at, at the edge. It turns out that this is next to a Wolverine cluster, so where we see Wolverine stars, uh, Wolverine features in the, in the stellar con continuum, which is a source of very high ionization. So this kind of sounds plausible. Then we're going to select here in this O1 diagram all the gas which is below the star formation line. So this is gas which you would expect from photoionization until a, until a limit of here. So this is the highly ionized gas. And when you plot that in the galaxy, um, ah, what I forgot to say, the background here is the ionization map again. So this is O3 over S2 in grayscale. And so white is highly ionized, black is lower ionized. And you see that all this high ionized gas falls exactly at the white area, again, as you expect. And you see that basically the entire um, starburst area plus part of the outflow, the base of the outflow, the ionization is driven by photoionization. So here the Lyman continuum photons fully dominate the ionization mechanism. Then we're going to move to the low ionization star formation gas. And so this is with a low O3 over H beta ratio. And this gas seems to be all located here in the eastern part. And this is also where we see in a stellar continuum the H beta ab absorption. So we're looking here at an older stellar population. This is, has not, this is, oh, sorry. This probably is not, this is not from the starburst, but this is an older stellar population. And again, has then less ionizing photons. And now we're gonna look at all the gas, which is coinciding with the shock models of Allen et al. and above the star formation separation line. And what you see, that you find a ring around this starburst area, which, is, which has a high O1 over H beta, over H alpha ratio. So this looks like we have a shocked ring of gas around the starburst. And then the last things I want to show quickly is that in the nitrogen, um, in the O3 H beta nitrogen H alpha BPT, you have these dots here which have an enhancement in nitrogen. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about it. You can ask me if you want to know more. And it turns out that there is nitrogen and enriched gas probably caused by the Wolverine clusters we have in this galaxy. So to summarize it, the central starburst in this galaxy and part of the outflow is dominated by photoionization, as you expect, because that's where the clusters are. This very high photoionization around the Wolverine clusters. Also, we have helium-2 emission. Outside that, 
the gas becomes more shock dominated. And so this could be explained by a, a large super bubble around the starburst, which is expanding into the more neutral gas and creating that gas to, to shock. And, and towards the old stellar population, we find more, more, more neutral gas. So to put up my summary, now it's time you can go to Astro PH and check the paper, which has a lot more information than I just could show you in these 12 minutes. And so the ISM, the ISM of ESO 38 is highly modified by stellar feedback. It's super highly ionized. We, we, we find shocks due to the expanding super bubbles. We find a galactic scale outflow, nitrogen enrichment. We find ionization channels. And so this is probably the way Lyman continuum photons can escape, which also brings to a conclusion that the escape of Lyman continuum might very well not be isotropic. We've seen this in many nearby galaxies where you see ionization channels being, uh, see, you see channels being highly ionized. So if you look by accident in the wrong direction, you might not see any Lyman continuum escape. So with that I would like to add. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I am impressed because the um, local Lyman continuum leakers seem to be aware but uh, since the beginning of this morning, we, we have a lot of predictions about them. Uh, we, should, we should have found so many, and we don't find any, so... Uh, we have, I mean, this, one is, this one is too near to be detected yes, easily in COPS, so we can sure. only do indirect. Uh, okay, so, a question? Just to support your conclusions about stellar feedback, I quickly... Uh, so, there's a very powerful ULX sitting in the center of your cluster. I don't know, it's crazy extra luminosity 10 to the power 41, which will give you easily 10 to 50, 10 to 51 ionizing photons. I scrolled your archive paper, I didn't find uh, mentioning of it, so. No, I just. There was, there was definitely okay. supernova, and there are also a lot of mechanical energy through jets, most likely. So, yes. if, if you want after coffee break. I'll yes, let's, uh, let's talk, thank you. More comments? Another question? Yeah, so thank you very much. And the last uh, talk before, before lunch is by Jose Vilches. He will talk about nebula helium-2 emission in uh, very famous baby galaxies, uh, two young baby galaxies. We should, uh, we might uh, name them like that. So they are 1518 and NBS 0335 minus 052. Is this one? Have you loaded that or? to these two galaxies. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I, I have selected these two galaxies that uh, they are among the most lo local galaxies, among the most uh, poor in metallicity, you know, one very well known, 1Swiki18 and, and SBS 033550052E. Uh, I have done this work with, in collaboration with Carol Herith and many other people. They are, some of them are here. And the, you will see in the talk why we selected these two galaxies. Well, helium 2 here uh, matters because of the. I'm sorry. Helium-2 here matters because we are sampling actually the highest ionization part of the spectra. We are sampling uh, the, the, the part of the cell which is with ionization potential higher than 54 electron volts. So we are here in this part. This is the uh, set of a stellar cluster. You see this is the normal stellar cluster for, let's say, one-tenth of solar metallicity. You have this cluster 
for very low metallicity, near zero metallicity, you see that there's a boost of energy, ionizing energy in this part of the spectrum. And this is very, very important for the ionization, in particular for the Lyman continuum such as this conference that has been many years ago. Uh, the, the synthesis has provided the budget of uh, Lyman continuum photons and that and helium and helium two ionizing photons. You see that with metallicity, when metallicity goes down near zero, there is a boost of uh, the uh, properties of the ionizing properties of the clusters. And this is has, it's very important with helium-2. It's a good tracer of this part of the spectrum, and therefore it's a good tracer of the possible uh, population three or any other uh, population in the early stages of the universe. So what are the ionization sources of this helium-2 ionization uh, uh, in the spectra? Well, tra traditionally, the traditional sources of ionization of, uh, for helium-2 have been, well, very hot world star, fast shocks, ray binaries, and uh, so on. In particular, the hot world stars has been strongly favored canonically, let's say, but this interpretation has many problems, or at least some problems I will show here. In particular, the nebula helium-2 does not appear to be always associated. We know that world rayet. When you go with world rayet feature, when you go, for instance, this, uh, this is not only locally, but also at high redshift. You see in high redshift there are some results. This is, for instance, uh, a collection of this is a stack of spectra helium 2 emitter spectra by Casada about 2.5, but this is also the case. When you produce a synthesis with water jet inside, the water jet cannot fit the uh, helium 2 emission that is in the spectra. So there are some problems. There are problems there at very high redshift, but also there are problems nearby in the local universe. Uh, there are classical papers that where you see the, the extension of the helium 2 emission over the space H beta. And uh, versus the, the, the whole sample, that you can see that the, the, the galaxies which are world rayet features and galaxies which are, don't have world rayet features, and they behave the same. And also in the study by Shirazi and Brickman, you see that there are many helium 2 emitters, but 40% uh, of them they don't show at all uh, world rayet features. So the canonical picture of the, the very hot world rayet uh, uh, ionizing population to explain helium 2 fails, and it's not that simple. So we have to, in particular, when we go to very low metallicity, as you will see later, this is not working at all. On top of that, there are many other problems, in particular in very nearby galaxies. For instance, M33, you can find bubbles of helium-2 emitting emission, which no clear, no clear ionizing source whatsoever close. So they are very mysterious, but they are there. And also, this, has been, this work has been doing uh, we have been doing this work over the years and uh, with Daniel and many other and Carolina and uh, you will see that uh, always so they are clearly the world rayet population is displaced from the main bulk of the helium 2 so you see always that the helium 2 uh, population the helium 2 emission is displaced and not just uh, tens of parts in, in in some cases a lot they are displaced from the sources so the world rayet canonical world rayet star are not uh, uh, explaining everything, and uh, at least they were not explaining everything at very low metallicity. If we know that, and then what we we were to study with IFU this galaxy once we gating, which is one of the lowest metallicities local galaxy we know. This is one over 40 solar, uh, and then we did that with an IFU, and uh, when we did that, we discovered that in the in this knot, the northwest knot, there is in fact is. Uh, like a helium-3 region, so it's a region of uh, it's fully ionized with helium-2. It's not just one point or two spots, but it's a real part of the galaxy which is being heavily ionized by a very strong, uh, I don't know, a very strong source, I would say population, stellar population, we do not know, uh, but a very strong ionizing source. We identified that was published in uh, 2015 or 2015. 16, this is the helium-2 line, which is very impressive in the spectrum, or the integrated spectrum of the helium-2, and this is the, the total, the, the northwest north population, this is the helium-3 zone. So we did then the uh, complete helium-2 budget ionization, so this is a clear advantage of using IFUs that you can integrate spectroscopically the helium-2 line and then derive as a photometric uh, uh, budget uh, based uh, 
uh, calculation, the total helium-2 photon do you need to explain the emission you see. And uh, comparing with conventional helium-2 ionizing sources, I mentioned where rayets, shocks, X-ray binaries, etc. There are many other. This is explained in detail. I don't have time here to explain everything. But uh, these were enabled to explain the ionization of the, of the, of the helium-2 zone. Uh, those days we had to rely on the very hot star. They were just models. We do not know any local metal-free star. We just rely on models. And the models say that we need the peculiar very hot star. They say with nearly zero metallicity, nearly metal-free ionizing star, and probably fast rotators. And then we went to another galaxy just to check, but maybe it's once we get in so peculiar. So maybe it's just, you know, it's just one point in the middle of the universe, so that nothing means. So we went to the second galaxy that was SBS uh, 033502E. This is a galaxy that you know very well, and that this is a fantastic poster by Herens and collaborator. There is a nice paper also on the, that, that was presented on the escape of photons. This is an archival image uh, from HST, and you can see the, that has been studied many times, and the, they have the, the, the ionizing cluster there, and then this is the metallicity that has been confirmed and studied this of the other three to four times uh, percent solar. There are many people, there are several works, in particular Polis and other, has studied that very well. And then we went to this one, and that's go there to see what happened. And we have any problem at all, or it's just uh, uh, conventional? Can we, we can explain that we use this data from the archive, the data from I mentioned before, and then we we did very deep uh, imaging with the MUSE data to look for any helium two. This is the helium two zone, so there is the, the core of the region is more or less proportional, uh, analogous to this part, and these are the cluster and so on. This is the extended emission of the helium two. This is a core, very standard core, and a plume here. And this is amazing because it's over 1.5 kiloparsec. This is nothing that you can explain with just one, two, or three uh, warrior star or something like that. When you go here, you can uh, zoom on the, on the spectrum here. You can see that they are, these are the clusters that were in the HST image resolved here, and you can Actually, MBSH three main nodes of helium two. These three main nodes we started, we extracted the spectra, and you can see here the helium two is a very very strong helium two, in particular in node A and node B. You see the helium two is very impressive, and uh, also in the this is the, the, the main body integral integral spectrum, but also in the node C in the other one. So again, we start and do. Uh, and, and, and perform the same analysis about what is the initiation, what is the, the source of ionization of this helium-2 emission, the extended emission, and in particular, the overall budget. So starting with the most simple approach, we had to look first into the sources of ionization. One would be uh, shocks, as uh, uh, the, the former speakers explained before, shocks are very beautiful because if you go to the BPT diagram, you will see that the Allen and other, but Allen 209, you can nearly fool the whole BPT diagram with uh, predictions from shocks. This is wonderful. Nearly, I would say, the full. But uh, you have to disentangle them, which is the real one. This is very good because you can find your point with a, with a model of a shock, but this is very, you know, at the same time, it's very bad, because you cannot actually critically disentangle. But there, as uh, he, has, he showed before, uh, there are some line ratios that helps a lot, in particular the oxygen one and sulfur two, rather very, very critical. And then we did an analysis of the initiation structure, and we proved that the shock's presence in this region of the helium-2 emission is negligible at the standard of the helium-2 budget. So it's very interesting. You can see here, this is the helium-2 emission uh, region, and these are the regions of uh, nitrogen-2 and sulfur-2 and oxygen-1, and they cannot explain at all the, the present. There are, for sure, there are some shocks, but they are minimal in comparison to the, 
to the uh, ionization budget. Then we went to the uh, X-rays, of course, and there are X-rays in this galaxy that have been studied before, that you have some references here, and uh, in, the, in the paper, or the paper was just this summer, on the print, uh, it was published this summer in monthly notices, and you see here there is a, a core, this is a core of, uh, of uh, emission, very hard X-rays, which is associated to the main body, the core of the main body of the region, so where the clusters are, so on. This is the hard emission. And then you have the soft emission here, associated to the extended emission, and probably associated to the diffuse X-ray emission, and also to the plume of, of emission. So uh, we perform an analysis of the budget from the X-rays. This is very critical, because the, that was Chandra data, and this is, I mean, you had to integrate with CARE. This is not simple at all. So we produced these two apertures for region one and region two. And then in this image, you can see that this is the, the, the bluish is the, the extended X-ray emission. Here it is. And the hardest X-ray here and so on. So we pro you produce the photometry here in these two in these two boxes, rectangular boxes, and then produce the integration and fit the models to, this, to derive the total energy of the set that you can derive from this. The comp for the metallicity of the galaxy, we know the metallicity of the galaxy very well, as I mentioned before. So in doing that, we came out to the conclusion that we are far by 10 to the 2, at least, uh, far from the energy we need to explain the helium-2 region that we had uh, mapped in this work. Then, when you go, of course, to Warrayet, that's uh, our favorite, when you go to the Warrayet, the hot Warrayet, that has been studied in the galaxy, in particular this part near the superstar cluster 3. There were no, it was known that there were some Warrayet, but we <coughs> discovered another one here. There is another cluster here, several pixels, and these are the, the Warrayets. You can see the, the bumps here. And this is amazing because with this, physically, fitting these bumps physically, because it's photometrically, uh, this, this is photometric, photometrically calibrated, so it's luminosity, we fitted that and produced the output of the expected output from this uh, uh, warrayet, hot warrayet, and they are far also from uh, the output, we, the input we need for ionizing the helium-2. So we have used many other models. There are many in the paper I cannot explain here, but there are models for zero metallicity stars, as in the case of 1 Suki 18 fast rotators, but also we have used the BPAS uh, uh, models that uh, introduce binarity that uh, uh, Elizabeth is explained us and, uh, last yesterday, and then we compare with uh, the, the input, with this, uh, the output of the models, and we came out to the conclusion that with these models, we can actually, because we have the total, the total uh, budget of even two ionizing photons, and then we integrated the models below the 54 electron volts, and then we came out to the conclusion that uh, when you go to very low metallicity, below 10 to the minus five, you can accommodate a solution uh, to explain that, uh, with a minor population of very low metallicity of this order, be past uh, top heavy IMF, IMF models. So that's, that's great, because the first time I actually was a part of the zero metallicity models that I can do the, the actually I can do the budget. And uh, that's, that implies that uh, this is a result which is entirely consistent when we go to, from 1 to 18, and that means that there are challenging implications for state of the art our models in the line with previous results for one to gating and also with recent findings by Daniel and collaborators for Redshift 2 at the Lancet Galaxy, where they discovered also a very, very strong emitter and helium 2. Well, thank you very much. That's all what I have. Thank you very much. Is there any comment or questions? Yes. Well, you have to press the button. Press the have button. you? Where is the button? Press the button. A reddish one.
Ja? So, komm her. Um. I was curious about the, um, the extended helium-2 emission in the shell that I also saw and that also you show now that is spatially coincident with the soft x-rays. Um, so there seems to be some connection. Um, you say that it's not enough, um, the, um, the, the x-ray photons, but if you also just look at the shell region, it's not enough. That would be my first question and my second question would be you say that you can explain it with extremely low metallicity um, from the B-pass models, but um, I think you, in this case you cannot reconcile all the other observed properties of the emission lines, um, like the ra line ratios for, for example, O3 over H alpha and so on. You, Have, I, I start with very interesting, for by, yeah, by the second, the second is easier. Yeah, uh, you mean uh, using B-pass, using the other line ratios, that's what you mean? Yeah. yeah, sure, for sure. I was first to the, you know, the base zero level, uh, I was to solve the zero level problem and then more or less it's solved and then I will go later, we will go later on on the other. Uh, because our problem was zero level, it was just helium two. Now we can go further to see whether, I mean, we can fine tuning the, Yes, uh, you are right. Uh, in, oops, in connection with the emission, we, we thought exactly at the beginning, first glance, exactly what you are uh, asking. When we saw that, we say, that's it. That's it. So you have the standard emission and then you have the core and so on. And then we go there and we, we did that uh, very carefully and so on. But the numbers, when you do, when you do the integration, the, you, you derive the set, you produce the, the, the numerical budget doesn't account for the whole helium two emission. I'm sure, I'm sure there there are this in, is is I mean is producing ionizing emission, but that not explain the helium the, the whole helium two. So unfortunately the, the ionization, I mean the, the special resolution is poor, but uh, I'm sure this is related. But this is related to the source, but I don't know, we do not know that Explain that not explain the helium two, the, the, the ionizing budget. Okay, thank you. So before we, we leave for uh, another question, yes, please go ahead. Sorry. So uh, I was just wondering what spectrum you're assuming for the X ray uh, luminous objects, because I wonder whether there is a, a tail of objects which are not showing up in the hard x-rays, but could still be producing this very hard UV radiation. What, what spectrum are you assuming for the accreting x-ray binaries? Say again. What, 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 what spectrum are you assuming for the accreting x-ray binaries? Yes, we assume, well, what spectrum do you mean? The, alpha, the, 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 hmm. the, the real, the, I don't remember exactly now. We, we assume several several possibilities. Okay. We assume several possibilities because we were wondering about that exactly. But uh, um, I can tell you, it's on the paper, I can tell you later because the, I know exactly the, 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 the slopes and the set of points and so That What would be very interesting is to add, to produce models because this is, uh, I mean, the B-pass, when, when you integrate and we scale B-pass to one million to our, our mass, there are some a small amount that we can fit. And probably X-rays produce some amount that can be added on top of the, of the, of the ionizing cluster. Probably, that we have to do the whole, uh, the whole budget with different, different uh, inputs. But uh, I will tell you the, the exact, I have the data there. Okay, okay, thank you. So be, before we move, le let us first uh, thank um, Jose to have uh, given this uh, very inspiring talk about young galaxies and baby galaxies or young galaxies. And that uh, uh, makes me remember that uh, today is a special day for you, Jose, because uh, today is uh, Jose's birthday. So, <laughs> and who is uh, much, much, much more younger, much younger than the galaxies you were talking about, even if they are young. 
So I hope we, we can uh, give you a toast this, uh, at lunch or at dinner. And uh, happy birthday, Jose. Yeah, so, so we will celebrate. We will celebrate with Pepe's birthday tonight in Hanya. Uh, just to remind you that we have uh, two buses waiting for us at half past seven. Uh, and then uh, we will drive to Hanya to we'll go to the old Venetian uh, harbor. And uh, we'll have dinner together in a restaurant there. Yeah, half past seven. <laughs>